الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد so the uh, title of this lecture uh, is my translate as the methodology or the manhaj the Arabic word I'm looking for of Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jana'ah in acquisition derivation of uh, in acquisition of their creed of their creed derivation of its issues and refutation of the heritage. So, the, as I said, the, the title of this lecture, and inshallah, the lecture after this is The Methodology or the Menhaj of Ahlul Sunnah and Jana'a in the acquisition of their creed, is how they obtain the aqidah, creed over here in the aqidah, the derivation of its issues, the particulars of that creed, how they derive it, and how do they refute, uh, how, uh, how do they refute the heretics or the mutabi'in, those who uh, oppose them in matters of belief? Uh, before I start with the lecture, I'd like to explain why did I choose such a topic. I think many people, especially those who are only familiar with English body of literature, would be surprised, you know, what would be the importance concerning that. And that is because I sort of sensed uh, some time ago that while, alhamdulillah, there are strides being made towards teaching people correct aqidah in the sense of teaching them particulars of faith, the whole methodology, the whole basis, the whole foundation upon which Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah uh, base their faith is not really explained often. And the reason for this is basically twofold. First, that the lack of people who are uh, qualified in North America, not to say that I'm qualified, of course, in lecture, but that uh, the lack of qualified scholars who speak English to discuss this. And second of all, because usually this topic has, is uh, in the past, found scattered in the works of the scholars, and until recently, you did, don't find many works trying to elucidate this methodology in simple terms which can be easily taught in a session like this, until as of late. Uh, previously, the scholars throughout the centuries would discuss this either um, in different uh, parts of their book, they would maybe touch on the issue here or there, or they would discuss it in such uh, voluminous work, such large work that it's very difficult to try to digest and then uh, deliver as lectures and so forth. So I put down some points which I gathered from some of these uh, modern writings uh, discussing this, and these scholars or students of knowledge have sort of thoroughly and adequately gone through these classical works and have tried to present it for uh, people to understand. The principles which I'll be talking about, uh, whether uh, Jamal is published in a little essay, uh, perhaps I translated in an issue of uh, Al-Bashir about, I guess, two issues ago or something like that, concerning the fundamentals of Hassan Jamal. So if there are some points that I sort of say quickly and it's difficult to write down, you can refer to that maybe. Break down for these Out of stock. Huh? Out of stock. Out of stock. Wait until we can photocopy it. Uh, we have it on the PC at the hotel. We can very print some copies of those four points. But before I get into the topic, is the first issue, and basically I've divided this topic into about uh, three or four sections. The first section is just, is just a basic introduction. What does uh, certain terms mean? I mean, when we're discussing now, we're going to be using terms. I said the word free, for instance now as an English term. Well, if you look up in what's the dictionary, you look at the word creed, it might mean something uh, not what we're looking for in this discussion. So we're talking about terms like aqidah and tawheed. Uh, what does ahl sunnah wa jama'ah mean? What do we mean when we say the word as-salaf salah These are certain terms which have a religious uh, import to it, a religious significance. And we need to understand these terms in light of the Quran and sunnah. The first part is a little introduction to some of these terms. The second part will be a discussion of some of the sources of uh, Ahlul Sunnah Jama'at Aqidah, which basically covers this first little aspect over here, the acquisition of their creed. 
In other words, they base their belief on certain sources, and their size in general, and I will discuss these sources uh, in brief. Uh, the third will be, uh, section will be some unique characteristics that distinguish the aqid of Ahl al Jama'ah from all other creeds, whether from the different sects which exists within this Muslim community, this Muslim Ummah, and also from other religions outside of the Islamic religion. There are certain characteristics, unique characteristics, and I think I have six or seven, that um, separate the belief of the Sunni, Ahlus al Jama'ah, Orthodox Muslims from all other creeds. And then we come into the third part, uh, which is the fourth part, the derivation of its issues. And these are the twelve principles that I have, or some principles, which how do we actually derive the different issues of belief. And there are about 10 or 12 principles. And then finally, uh, this one, the last principle of these, which they derive, is how they refuse, and this has 20 principles underneath it, and that's the refutation of the heretics. In other words, those people who go against the Ahlus and Jama'ah, how do they uh, uh, refuse them? So this is in general what these two lectures are going to cover, and I will try my best to cover this. Just to give you an example of how this topic is a very deep uh, topic, one of these uh, four principles, or ten principles that I'll mention in their derivation of this issue, uh, one scholar of Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, wrote ten volumes just concerning it. And this is an issue which you might have first discussed uh, uh, from Brother uh, Jamal's uh, tapes on uh, al asraniyun the modernist, and that's the question of revelation and reason, and how do we uh, deal with this if we consider, if, there's, if we imagine or if we uh, feel that there is some sort of contradiction. I mean, even Timmy wrote uh, in ten volumes recently it was published uh, an edited version of this manuscript of one of his works, and you might imagine that in just ten volumes, you know, just for us to discuss this one issue this whole week, if we were just to discuss it, we really wouldn't be able to give the topic its due. So my thought than to talk about all these principles of Latin and Jamal and try to sum it up in a couple of lectures is really not giving the topic its, its right. However, the idea is just to place a foundation Right? For further investigation and study with uh, qualified people, qualified leaders, inshallah, that will allow us to, you know, learn from them. And we will be able to benefit, but at least now we just try to inform ourselves, so when we come across these scholars, we can, you know, uh, benefit from them. Okay, so, coming to the first point, and these are, you and I just said, since I see you brothers are adding, that is a whole person to write notes, uh, introduction, And this is a definition of certain terms. The definition of certain terms. What are some, some certain specific terms? Uh, the first term we're going to take is aqidah, which you'll find me often calling it creed. This is just the way I translate it, and not to say that. So. I'll sound with the translation. Oh, I know. Okay, so the brothers have uh, well, uh, linguistically the word aqidah, uh, which I've chosen to translate as creed, as I said, has a number of meanings. I mean, in the sense that it's just linguistical uh, import. Any religious term in the Islamic uh, religion, any religious term, usually has a definition which is found in the language, which was used prior to the revelation, prior to this, uh, uh, sending the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then it has a specific religious meaning, you know, or a convention, religious convention, shara'i meaning, or istilahi, uh, which is based upon that linguistical meaning. The word aqidah, uh, comes from the, uh, Arabic maqbar, or verbal noun, uh, aqada, which means, uh, linguistically has a number of meanings. One of it is to, to knot, and to bind and to tighten fastly, or fasten tightly, and to also has a sense of to fortify, and to consolidate, and to cement. These are all the linguistical basis of this word aqidah. However, by convention, when the scholars uh, use this term aqidah in, in religious writing, they mean a certain meaning, and that is any form unwavering belief which is not open to any doubt with its beholder. Irrespective of that belief is true or false, any belief that a person has in his heart that's firmly established in that person's heart and it's unwavering in the sense the person has no doubt concerning the truth of that belief 
Irrespective of that belief is true or false in itself, this is called the Aqidah in the uh, religious convention. So therefore, uh, tomorrow is Sunday, no, tomorrow is Saturday. Things are missing months and days now. So uh, uh, Sunday, uh, two days from now, the Christians, you know, will go to their churches and they will uh, in preach uh, Isa the Maryam and his mother Mary, they're Catholic, and they have a belief in the Trinity. This is their Aqidah even though we consider it to be a false belief, because this belief in their heart is something which is strong and it's unwavering and they hold it to be true. So the term aqidah in the most general sense means any firm, unwavering belief that a person holds in his heart, whether that belief is true or false. Okay, that's the, the meaning of it, in the most general sense. In the most specific sense, when we say aqidah, we usually refer to the true aqidah, to the Islamic aqidah. And specifically when we say Islamic aqidah, we mean the, the aqidah of Ahl al-Sunnah al jamaah who hold the um, true faith that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi came with, as I'll explain shortly. In this context, when we take Islamic Aqidah, we, uh, we mean basically a firm, unwavering belief in a certain amount of certain matters or certain uh, issues. The first issue in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, a firm, unwavering belief in Allah, this is the Islamic Aqidah, mind you. Islamic Aqidah. And of course, it's according to Ahl Sunnah and Jamaah. So it's a belief in Allah. And what is due to Allah? What is His right? From worship, Allah, Tawheed, you know, and also uh, obedience. Two, His angel. Three, His scripture. Four, His prophets and messengers, five the last day, six his, um, his decree, and four measurements, which we call an Arabic Qadr. And seven, whatever is found in the Quran, of the water Q, and Sunnah, from matters of the unseen, previous nations, and A, B, and C, and also things that will pass before the day of judgment. And, and four measurements, three destinations, you know, four measurements, other, other. And finally, number eight is right over here. All absolute issues in the religion whether dealing with faith or uh, action. Okay, let me explain this. We said that the aqidah in the most general sense is any firm, unwavering belief, whether true or false. In a specific sense, when we say Islamic aqidah, or the aqidah of the jama'ah, we mean certain things. We just sort of listed them over here. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what is due to Allah from Tawheed, which will be the next lectures after we finish these two lectures, uh, Saturday and Sunday lectures, and obedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faith in his angels, a firm, unwavering belief, you know, with not any doubt concerning his angels, his scriptures, his book, his prophets and messengers, the last day, the day of judgment, the, his decree and four measurements, and I mean by this, uh, al-qadr al-qadr, uh, seven, whatever is found in the Quran and the Sunnah, like the Q and the Esther, uh, concerning matters of the unseen, like concerning, uh, the descriptions of any matter of thing which is un- unseen, the ghayb, as they use the term in Arabic, the previous nations, like for instance the Jews of Quran, is sort of a text 
right? This is a sunnah to read on Salat al Jum'ah. There is a description of previous people, previous nations, like Bur Qarasne, right? And also in the sunnah, you find the Prophet Sallallahu talking about the previous nations and so forth. And also things that will come uh, to pass before the Day of Judgment, the different signs and the occurrences that will happen herald in the approach of the Day of Judgment. And finally, all absolute issues, meaning all issues in which there is no doubt, right? Over here the word absolute means there is something that has no doubt to it, in the religion, whether pertaining to uh, matters of faith or matters of action. So therefore, the our belief that the law, there are five obligatory prayers in the day, our belief that uh, the month of fasting is Ramadan, that it's kind of everything will to fast during the month of Ramadan, except for those few cases. Uh, this is part of the Aqidah, because it's an absolute issue, okay? And uh, I'll have some maybe further discussion concerning that. So we say the Islamic Aqidah, we mean all of all these matters. Yes, sir. Okay, a good proof, yeah. Obviously, uh, with a lot of these issues, the scholars, and this is a good point to bring out, that when we're discussing these issues, there is nothing that says there are eight issues. I mean, the scholars looking into the text of the Quran and Sunnah derive these issues. As far as these issues, uh, the, the foundation of faith is drawn from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when Jibreel came to and asked him concerning Iman. And he said that Iman is to believe in Allah and his angel and his book and his messengers in the last day and also to believe in Al-Qadr. Right? Khayri wa sharrihim in Allah Ta'ala the good and evil out uh, consequences of what Allah has decreed. Uh, now, whatever is found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, obviously when you say that you believe in the book, and you believe in the messenger, that it entails believing whatever is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. For further classification, to make it more understandable, the scholars have mentioned three things. The unseen. Because somebody might not, and what do I mean by the unseen? For instance, part of our belief is that we believe that over the hellfire there is a bridge, a surah. And this surah, or bridge, which the Prophet ﷺ described as being as thin as a hair strand, and as sharp as a sword's edge. And the people will pass on it according to the measure of action. And those who have a lot of good deeds will pass very quickly, and those who have few good deeds will crawl, and some of them will even fall off the bridge and fall into the hellfire in the Salah al -Afiyya. So, this matter is a matter of the unseen. It really falls underneath belief in the last day, it falls underneath belief in the prophets and the messengers because the prophet Muhammad has told us this. It follows into belief into the scriptures because there is an indication of this in Surah Maryam. Allah just trans out says, none of you accept that they will wariduha. Okay, and the prophet is saying this to you, the sirat, that the enemy will accept will come across it. And also has a, a part of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of this information. He's the one who reveals this to us uh, through the Qur'an and through the Sunnah. Now, some people might not see very quickly the relationship of how a surah spills into these, you know, pillars of faith. So, to tell us for further clarification, they have said all matters of the unseen, you see, just to make it a little bit easier for people to understand. Previous nations also, I mean, by way of the Qur'an and Sunnah, as about the children of Israel and so forth, and likewise, the signs before the Day of Judgment, that's part of faith in the Day of Judgment, part of faith in scriptures and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but also just to further classify to make it just for the sake of learning uh, to facilitate learning. And likewise, all absolute issues, these eight things, uh, whether uh, whether dealing with matters of faith, of belief, iman, or uh, ahkam, actions, regulations, this also is part of belief in the scriptures and the Prophet, in, in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, as this is all uh, informed to us through the read of Quran and Sunnah and the source of this revelation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course. So you can see this is just a, a means of classification. In no way it's a hard and fast uh, you know, uh, way of classification in the sense that if somebody was to now enumerate ten matters or to enumerate just six matters, therefore you would consider him to be not possessing the correct faith. And I'll give you an example for that. If, um, for those of you brothers who might know the verse in the Khalakim of Surah Al-Baqarah, the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, where it says, Amr al huh? Mm -hmm. So what, what are the matters of faith that they believe in? Mm -hmm. He's looking for more, because... <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. How many? Oh, four. So, in the Hadith of Jibreel. 
Uh, mentions belief in Allah and his angels and in the book, scriptures, meaning in whole and the last day and the messengers. So, you find the Quran, some principles are mentioned, some other principles are mentioned, but still, this doesn't have any contradiction. Why? Because really, belief in Qadr, belief in Qadr, or belief in this sixth principle, in his decree and full measurement, is part of belief in Allah, because it deals with Allah's actions and Allah's wisdom, which is part of his attributes and so forth. So, this really turns into this principle. I and mean, it is said by some scholars of hadith that the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned this and separated this from a belief in Allah because uh, the Prophet was aware that people would deny Qadr from his Ummah and he wanted to stress the importance of this belief in the subject. And that's one explanation. Now, I'm sorry, this is that. That's all. No. Uh, maybe uh, you know, like that, that the some people, if someone says that uh, they will just believe in those five things which are mentioned in the Quran, one to five, and do not believe in the degree because it's not in the Quran directly, they mention along with those five. That's for reasons for uh, okay. further study later on. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the point I'm trying to make now. I mean, what are we trying to understand here? The word aqidah, what does it mean? It means a firm, unwavering faith. Okay, uh, belief with the beholder, and then we say the Islamic aqidah. We mean these matters which I have um, listed over here on uh, the board. Now we should understand that the question which perhaps might have come to your mind and is that this term aqidah does it appear in the Quran and the Sunnah? I mean, we hear these people who like to talk all about aqidah, aqidah, aqidah. Where is this word in the Quran and the Sunnah? And the truth of the matter is that the word aqidah is never mentioned neither in the Quran or the Sunnah, nor is there seems to have, and to the best of my knowledge, anything which indicates this term. However, the term which is used, the Quranic term, which is used is iman. Iman. And this is the Quranic uh, term uh, to use it. Likewise, there are other terms which the scholars of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah uh, have used of similar meaning, and they are, in many senses, you might consider synonymous, meaning they all mean the same thing. Uh, another term is a tawheed. And we find this used uh, by the earlier scholars. Uh, for instance, I always like to give examples of books you can find in the English language. Imam al-Bukhari's translation uh, uh, of, of his great work of Sahih, the last volume, volume 9, the last book of it, in it you'll find a book called Kitab al-Tawheed and the Reputation of al-Jahmiya. So this was a, uh, a term used to explain matters of belief. If you look through it, you'll find it's just dealing with Allah's attributes and his speech. Uh, however, they called it a tawheed. And the reason why, because the single most important issue of the Islamic belief is our belief concerning Allah. And our belief concerning Allah is uh, described or stands out in the sense that it has strict tawheed, very clear tawheed in both in the sense of our belief. We don't believe in a trinity, we believe that we do not believe that Allah has any partner or that anyone has any equal to his name, sharing his names and attributes. And likewise, it's tawheed in our actions and our worship in the sense that we worship Allah alone and we do not divert any act of our worship to anybody besides Allah. So they used to call it a tawheed for that reason. Likewise, they would call it a sunnah. And this was probably a very classical term, more used by the classical scholars than the term a tawheed. So these are synonymous terms, okay? Synonymous terms or terms of similar meaning to aqidah. A uh, tawheed, and the example I put in Sahih al Bukhari, alright? And two, a sunnah. We find, if you, for those brothers who have the ability to read Arabic or who have come across an Arabic book, uh, you will find that there's a lot of classical works dealing in aqidah concerning a sunnah. And they call it by a sunnah. Imam Ahmed has a work called the sunnah. His son Abdullah, the son of Imam Ahmed, has a work called the Sunnah. Ibn Baqa has a work called the Sunnah. 
And then Lakai has a work which is called Shaf the Sula Sunnah, explanation of the fundamentals of the Sunnah. This was something which they used to use over and over, this term of Sunnah. And in English you will find if you read Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, volume 3, and there you'll find a book called Kitab al Sunnah, and when you open it up you'll find just basically a discussion of different beliefs held by Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So they used to call their beliefs and they used to label it as Sunnah. Okay, and the reason why, because the most important thing in what the Prophet Muhammad came with, now Sunnah meaning what actually the Prophet Muhammad came with, his religion, his Sharia, in the most general sense. The most important thing is the belief, because that's the foundation of the Prophet's religion. That's why they used to call it a Sunnah. You know, the scholars have different opinions concerning certain regulations, certain ahkam, uh, concerning certain ways of uh, doing particulars in the worship of Allah SWT, or particulars in buying and selling, or particulars in marriage and divorce, or particulars in ruling and politics. The ulama, going from the time of the Prophet's companions and throughout the centuries, have differed concerning this. And there's reasons for their differences, but there are differences. But in belief, they all had a common belief, and that was the foundation which these, these are based upon, and that is why we need to label these things as a sunnah. And also to distinguish themselves from the people of Bid'ah, or the heretics, who they would say these are the beliefs of the people of Bid'ah. So if you look at, if you investigate Sunan Abu Dawood, Volume 3, Kitab al-Sunnah, you'll find in there, he starts off saying the importance of adhering to the Sunnah, and then he talks about what, perhaps the, uh, the merits of the Prophet's companions, who refuse against the Shia, the Rasulullah who attack them. He discusses Allah's attributes to refuse those people who deny them. He'll make a discussion of some of the matters we hear hereafter, like uh, the trial and the torment of the grave, the prophet's uh, pond or pool or uh, basin, al uh the bridge over the hellfire at Siraj, to refute those people who rejected these matters, and so forth and so on. So he's mentioning matters of belief here in that uh, work. Also they would call it Usul al-Din, Usul al-Din, I guess this is the preferred American uh, transliteration for you, sir. Usul uh, al-Din, meaning the foundation or the fundamentals of the religion. And sometimes we call it Usul al-Diyana. Diyana means like Deen. This is the term used by Ibn Baqla in his work. He calls it al-Ibana or the exposition and Usul al-Diyana. The exposition of the foundation of a Diyana or the religion. Uh, the fourth term that they would use is Sikh al-Akbar or the, um, the, uh, the greater fiqh, the greater understanding. And this is the term labeled in the uh, work which is attributed to Abu Hanifa. Unfortunately, it seems that the work is serious and it's not really from the pen of Abu Hanifa. However, you might have seen, uh, I think it's printed by a few publications in uh, Brooklyn, New York. They have a little few pages just enlisting some beliefs. They said this is the creed of Abu Hanifa. And however, the work seems to be serious as some scholars have pointed out, like the Zahabi and others. So they would call it Sikh al So this is just another term that they use. Uh, another term that they would use, and this is probably the last one, is called um, a sharia a sharia And we find uh, this in a classical book by a scholar called Al-Ajurri. Al-Ajurri, he has a book called Al-Sharia, and if you open it up, you'll, you won't find matters uh, concerning the hudud, prescribed punishments, or concerning buying and selling, or concerning marriage, but rather you'll find an exposition of the faith of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. So these are five terms which we will find in the classical writings, all indicate what we now call Aqidah. It seems that in our day, the prevalent term, or the parlor of the scholars, basically, is Aqidah, and that's why the term I, I chose to use for the title of the lecture. And that's the term which we started off with the definition. But these terms are basically synonymous. And they're just different ways of describing that foundation of faith. Now, of course, we said the correct, or not the correct term, or the better term, the term which is found in the Quran and the Sunnah is what again? Iman. Iman. So somebody was to come to you and argue with you and say, okay, where is it that you find that Tawheed, Sunnah, Sulubin, Sikhalat, Sharia, and so forth, Aqidah in the Quran and the Sunnah? We say, no, this is Al Iman, what Allah has described as Al Iman and what the Prophet ﷺ has described as Al-Iman, and these are just synonymous terms to describe that reality, which is referred to as Iman al-Quran al-Sunnah. 
And it, in itself, it's not an issue whether uh, you want to call it an iman or you want to call it something else. Was there any reason for using these terms other than using iman? Right. Well, there's, there are some reasons for it. One reason is that as, you know, Islamic civilization sort of um, uh, progressed and so forth, uh, knowledge became uh, codified. Okay, and this is just a, this is, and so the people start to become specialized. When the Prophet Sallallahu would teach his companions, they wouldn't have, okay, today we have a lecture on Shuk, you know what I'm saying, today we have a lecture on Tohi, uh, tomorrow we're going to be on grammar, and so forth. No. But as the Islamic civilization uh, flourished, they started to specialize and uh, codify their knowledge, and write specific work concerning specific branches of knowledge. And this is a, this is a uh, characteristic of all civilizations, whether it's Based, the civilization is based upon something on revelation like the Islamic civilization or upon pagan civilization. That as they become more advanced, they start specializing and codifying. The second thing is that there, are, there were certain reasons for this. A lot of times that these terms were in reaction to uh, beliefs held by people of bid'ah, of, of heretics. For instance, when the heretics start to speak about Allah, Okay, like the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah, which are two heretical sects, they would talk about Allah and His names and His attributes in an incorrect manner. And they would call this Tawheed, they would say, this is, you know, the correct belief concerning Allah, His oneness, this is monotheism. The scholars then came out and they would write books to refute it. You know, and they would use terms like a Tawheed. Uh, for instance, you find Imam al-Bukhari, who died in 256, he has Kitab al-Tawheed, and in one and in one uh, narration of Sahih al-Bukhari says, وَالرَّدُّ عَلَى الْجَعْمِيَةِ And it's a subtitle. So it's the book of Tawheed, of affirming, in this sense, Allah's names and attributes, and uh, the reputation of the Jahmiyyah, which is a sect which appeared uh, in towards the end of the Tabi'in, towards the end of the second generation, prior to Imam Bukhari, and they denied Allah's names and attributes. This is an example. When the people of Bid'ah, of, of heresy, started to talk and deny certain matters, the scholars said, no, this is the Sunnah. This is what the Prophet ﷺ came for, so he often called called Kitab al-Sunnah, and so forth and so on. Some of these terms, uh, there is some sort of questionability concerning uh, some of the understandings, or some of the uh, application, like Aqidah uh, and Usul al some scholars are critical concerning some of the finer meanings of these terms, because it seems to separate between belief and action, and therefore it can have an incorrect uh, input to it. Like it seems that the term Aqidah, as I was reading one time, Sheikh Bakr Abu Jay was mentioning, that it might have, it's really that this term was first used by the Ash'ari, uh, and it has some sort of uh, significance. And then later on it became, uh, you might say, um, employed by Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah and has a certain specific significance with Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. So that's some of the reasons, and that's another topic unto itself. But the important point is that, uh, Outside of these terms, which are, were used in the, the parlance of the Salah of Jama'ah, there are other terms which are, which mean the same thing in the sense that they all refer to what people believe in, but they are hallmarks of people of bid'ah, of, of, of and people of heresy. They used to describe their belief system. One is called Ilm al Okay, Ilm meaning knowledge, and al here means uh, dialectic. Okay, okay. So I like theology, I think is the, uh, the, uh, the, maybe the way they translate it from Oriental. So, uh, Kalam is a term used to describe belief by people, usually of heresy of bigger allies, the Ashari's, and so forth. A second term, which you find used, and used well, this should all be familiar with them, sir, called philosophy. Alright? And that's what That's being the Arabic, um, but philosophy, uh, okay. So the, uh, the point is that philosophy is a term which refuse, refers to beliefs and so forth, but is, is used usually by people of, um, ill belief, like people big ass, people of heresy, and also disbelievers. Likewise, another term is the solo. It also refers to certain beliefs, and this is called Sufism and sometimes mysticism. <laughs> and uh, fourth one is theology, uh, or al-ilahiyat is a term. The 
Arabic way of it. This is also a, and finally metaphysics is a classical term used by usually people of ill belief. So the point is, what I'm trying to say is that when you see these terms, right, they usually describe belief systems of people who have incorrect beliefs. But the idea, the general idea behind it, they're trying to describe that which certain people hold in their heart as true. The terms which were used by the scholars that have seen as I said, that uh, are six basically, this is an aqid over here, and the term which is employed by the Quran and the Sunnah is Iman. Okay? Yes. Right. Elm uh, uh could mean uh, logic in the sense that it's a good science of logic. Uh, it's sometimes similar to Elm al-Kalam, but there's different though. Because Elm al-Mantaq, usually the issues that they discuss in logic is different than the issues they discuss in Kalam. In Kalam they try to prove a logic system, and then they try to prove the um, the, the, the prophethood, the revelation, and then the last thing, the particulars of faith, using certain arguments. While Ibn al-Mansaq discusses things like the definition, what is the definition, what is al hajj and, you know, what is uh, the type of argumentation, you know, demonstration and so forth, they have different types of uh, argumentation, and perhaps you know, all will have an opportunity to the shift that kind of these skills. You know, if you have a good discussion. These terms are used by people who believe, but it's not supposed to be. Well, yeah, usually. Usually when you find these terms, you will find them used uh, by people with, who have incorrect beliefs. So what I'm trying to say is that in the general sense, we're all talking about aqidah. Because I said in the beginning of the term aqidah, when we say just a pure sense, aqidah, we mean whatever a person believes, whether that belief is itself is correct or incorrect. People describe that belief, well, there are ways that the scholars of Hasidah have described that belief, and there are ways people of bid'ah, of, of heresy, describe their belief. They usually use these terms, and also sometimes people from different religions, after you find a religion, will use terms like this. The term which you find a Quran is Imam. This is just a brief introduction uh, to that term. <laughs> okay, the next definition we're coming to is now Ahasidah was Jama'ah. Is we say that this is a discussion of the creed of Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. So who are the Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah that we're talking about? Now, I have chosen to translate this Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. I'll write it for you in Arabic. Okay, uh, and I'll try to write it. I usually translate this, the adherence of the Sunnah. And the Ma'a of the Assembly. Send me an email. That's right. And the Assembly. Okay, so the adherence of the Sunnah, the Ahl of Sunnah, and the Ma'a of the Assembly. What does this term mean? Well, Ahl al-Sunnah means those people, uh, to be Ahl of something in Arabic, uh, sometimes we translate as people and the people of the Sunnah. It really means the adherents. It means those people who have, uh, adhered and followed to the Prophet ﷺ Sunnah, not only in beliefs, of course, but also in their deeds, in their way of worship, in the, uh, way they regulate their affairs. In the sense of meaning they're buying and they're selling and they're trading in their marriage and divorce, in their politics, in their uh, matters of peace and war, and so forth and so on, and likewise in their morals, in their behavior, in their uh, manners and so forth. Uh, this is of course all embodied in Sunnah, and Ahl Sunnah al Jama'a means, Ahl Sunnah means those people who adhere to this standard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with, this religion, the Sharia, the Sunnah or way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the Sunnah literally means the way, and over here we need Whose way? I mean, the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, the Jama'ah, they were called the Jama'ah for three reasons. The first reason is that because they have gathered themselves, or they have assembled themselves upon this Sunnah. 
this truth, and they have not divided themselves into different sects. And I'll re- relate to you a hadith shortly about how the Prophet ﷺ foretold how his ummah was divided into 73 groups. So they were as jama'ah because they gathered themselves upon the sunnah. So there's a source, there's a foundation. Likewise, and they didn't divide themselves into different sects or groups or factions or parties and not as a religion. Okay? Second of all, that they adhere, uh, they're called the Jama'ah because they adhere to a certain understanding by the Prophet's companions. Uh, and the first three generations, you may say, a set of because they adhere to their unanimous consensus, their ijma' and they adhere to their understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. This is the second reason why they're called Jama'ah. The third reason why they're called Jama'ah is for a reason it's because they gathered themselves among around the truthful imam uh, the political leader of their time the uh, religious imam in the sense imam not in the religious sense but in the political authority of their time and not revolting out against themselves since they didn't split themselves off and revolt out against them so these are three uh, reasons why they were called the jama'a the first reason because they have gathered uh, upon the sunnah not dividing into sects. Number two, because they've gathered to the understanding here of uh, the Senate and I'll explain who the Senate are and their unanimous consensus. They are referred to the set of over here. Unanimous consensus. Which we call the map in Arabic. And three, because they do not revolt against the map. They gathered themselves because they gathered upon the imam and they did not revolt against you know how against them. I'm waiting for the on spot of questions concerning the third point now. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, first, uh, the first answer is that Jama and the question that it's up to the Nadia. Now um people translate that sometimes as the majority. Now, what is the proof of, of each one of these that, that the Jama'ah refers to as the Sunnah or Salaf al Qalih or um, the Imam of the time? Yeah. yeah. That comes from the points when we derive our points. How do we understand the Quran and the Sunnah? There's a sort of understanding, but quickly, in case we don't ever get to that, that point in the lecture. Uh, the, because Ibn Mas'ud said, Ibn Mas'ud said, the Jama'ah, whoever is upon the truth, even if it's by yourself, or even if you alone are upon the truth. So, because we say that they adhere to the understanding of the Salaf and their unanimous consensus, here we have Ibn Mas'ud, one of the Prophet Sallallahu companions, to find for us who the Jama'ah is. Okay, but it has a religious sense. It says the Jama'ah is, you know, من واسق الحق. Whoever agrees to truth or whoever adheres to truth, even if you're by yourself. Now, as far as the proof for the second aspect of the Jama'ah, that they are here to the Imam, this is from the Hadith of the Hudayfa, which is in the Bukhari and elsewhere. Prophet describing the splitting of the Ummah, he said, stick to the Imam and their Jama'ah. You know, and one of the, uh, during the time of uh, March uh, 5th, you had people calling people to help, the doors of hellfire. He said, stick to the Imam and their Jama'ah. So, here, they are called the Jama'ah because they stick to the Imam, they do not revolt. Obviously, over here, meant by the Imam, a political Imam. That's why today he said, and if there is no Imam and there is no Jama'ah, Seeing if there's no Khalifa of the Muslims, if there's no Sultan, if there's no Amir, what should I do in this case? Prophet uh, advised him to uh, separate himself from all the different factions, even if he has to go to the jungle and die uh, in starvation, something of that thing. So the point is, is that these, when we say Ahl Sunni or Jama'ah, or we say sometimes it's Sunni Muslim, or sometimes it's translated as Orthodox Muslim, uh, that we're trying to say three things here. We're saying that they are the adherents to Sunnah. 
And here the sunnah doesn't just mean sunnah as I mentioned earlier, just in belief. Right? But it means sunnah in the most widest sense. It means everything far apart from Kamal. Belief, actions, statements, morals, behaviors, and so forth. The proof is that uh, Iyab, yeah. yeah, there's one of the Sabi'in al Iyab, uh, al Fulayb, al Fulayb bin Iyab, sorry. Al Fulayb bin Iyab, when he was asked what is the Sunnah, he said it means to know what you have placed in your stomach, in your belly. Is it halal or is it haram? You see, he didn't say that a Sunnah means to uh, say that Abu Bakr is most deserving of the Khilafah than Umar than Uthman than Ali and to believe in Qajar, and to believe the Qur'an is uncreated but the literal spoken word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said it means to know what you have placed in your belly. Is it halal or haram? Meaning in the sense that obviously if somebody is going to apply the sunnah to that degree, that he is so careful to make sure that he only ingests that which is halal, by, he should be more careful to make sure that that which enters into his heart is only true and not false. So this was just the way of thinking. But the point is, it shows us that the sunnah, when we say Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah, doesn't just mean belief. Although belief is the foundation, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, is this definition clear, inshallah? Huh? They have gathered upon the sunnah not dividing into sects, factions, groups. Okay? The Arabic origination? Well, this is found in some of the uh, statements of uh, Ibn Abbas. He says, Ahl Sunnah wal Iqtila, uh, which you can find in uh, the tafsir of Surah Al Imran, the verses of Al Imran, in Ibn Kathir's tafsir. Now, whether this statement is, which has been attributed to Ibn Abbas, whether the chain of narrators reaching him is authentic or not, this is another question. But definitely, you know that Ibn Sirin, who was one of the Tabi'een, uh, as Imam Muslim mentions in his Muqaddimah, in his introduction to his work, he says, uh, talking about the, uh, the origin, as, as talking about the, uh, the origin of the Senate, of the chain of narrators, he says that prior to the fitna, we would not ask for a person concerning, you know, where did you get this hadith from? But when the fitna occurred, and when the division between the Muslims occurred, we started to ask, those are from the people of the Sunnah we would accept and those people who are people of the Gawi we would reject. So this term seems to have its um, origin as in this group of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah in both words way back in the earliest time. And obviously the term Sunnah and the Prophet saying to stick to his Sunnah and as the brother Yasser mentioned in a hadith where the Prophet describing the same sect that is the Jama'ah, you find it in the words of the Prophet he said, so, and so the, so the origin of this lies in Sharia, the word Sunnah and the word Jama'ah. But in, used together in one word, Ahlus and Jama'ah, probably Ibn Abbas or Ibn Sirin or in the early generations of Muslims at least. What, what do you say? Well, Iqtilaq. Iqtilaq means those people who, means like Jama'ah, means those people who have gathered, you know, and they have, um, together, they have not, uh, as opposed to ikhtilaf, which means that they have um, <laughs> Right, means that they have um, as opposed to uh, dividing themselves. Uh, you mentioned fitna. What do you mention in the fitna? This is a difference of opinion. I'll leave it to the scholars of hadith to point to us uh, the intent of the opinion in the fitna. So we have the next definition, and shall is the last definition. Then we come to the meat of the topic, inshallah. As-salaf. And usually we say as-salaf of salaf. As-salaf. As-salaf of uh, this term, a salaf of salaf, or a salaf, salaf literally means those which preceded you. Anybody who came before you, from your forefathers, or anybody, previous generations are called salaf. Over here, though, of course, we have a specific connotation, we have a specific meaning to it, and we mean those first three generations. The Prophet's companion, those tabi'in, their successors or their followers, and the ex tabi'in, the third generation, 
because these were the three generations which were specifically mentioned in the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari, it's referred by Imran bin Hussein, and Hussein and others, that the best of mankind was his generation, then that which came afterwards, and that which came afterwards. Some narrations add a fourth generation, and some uh, narrations, uh, wordings only have three generations. So, but generally three generations have been mentioned in this, in this hadith. So this is what we mean by Asara Fasara. So we mean the early generation of the Muslims, and also by extension, whoever follows them. Okay? Even if he comes after the first three generations, because we know that the Sahaba, the last uh, Sahabi, died year 110, maybe, right? 110. It was the end of the generation of the Sahaba. Okay? Now, the, the end of the generation of the I don't seem to recollect. Time, but I know that the end of the Asbar Tabi'in is usually considered at the year 210. It's considered when the Asbar Tabi'in has entered, the third generation has entered, the last of them, according to the, uh, the division of the scholars of Hadith and the Tabakat, the levels of narrators. Uh, we know, for instance, that Imam al Shafi died in year 205. Okay? Um, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who died in year 241. Bukhari died in 256. Okay? So you can see that. These uh, men are not even really strong in the first three generations. I mean, I don't think even Imam Shafi is considered from the third generation. He's probably considered from the fourth generation. Imam Malik is considered from the third generation, uh, from the Ibn Shafi. So obviously, can we now say that Imam Shafi or Imam Al Bukhari or Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal are not part of our setup and therefore their statements are not uh, acceptable? You know, we're only going to take those who come before two ten, and that's it. No, obviously not, because Whoever adheres to that principle of those first three generations, even if he comes from the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation, or even if he comes centuries later, like Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah, ibn Taymiyyah, right, who dies in the year 728, or uh, ibn Abdul for instance, who was, I think, in 1205. Uh, uh, these are all considered part of the Salaf in the sense that they all upheld that same principle. Abu Hanifa is 150. And he's from the lesser of the second generation. Not because he's, uh, don't misunderstand when I say lesser. <laughs> okay, the <laughs> Now, in the sense that it's usually they divide uh, the succeeding generations after the Prophet's companions to those who fought along the Prophet's companions, they call them as Al Kubra, uh, or the major, and then those, and that would be like Ibn Musayyid, Sa'id ibn Musayyid. And those are then they're called Al Wusra, the mid of that generation, and they also called the Sughra or Sughar, and that's uh, the third uh, level. Because Abu Hanifa, uh, and he's only met three or four of the Prophet's companions, and therefore he's considered a Sughar. So what's the theory doesn't mean in the sense of his, uh, you know, our esteem for him, but in the sense that how many of the companions he has. So, uh, so uh, a Sarah Fasara therefore means those first three generations, and anybody who adheres to that way, okay? And usually the appellation, uh, uh, we usually call them uh, a Salafi, alright, or a Salafi <coughs> with uh, I, okay, which is the Ya in Arabic, called Ya Nissa. When you uh, are associated with something, you usually add this Ya to it, and you're there for like uh, that. So, for instance, if somebody is from Misra, he's called a Misri, okay or a Shami, or a Mekti, or something like that. And if he's from a certain tribe, he'd be called a Hamini. Hamini, that's a good example. <laughs> and, or Hashimi, that's better. And if he's also a certain sect, or if he adheres to a certain group of people, he would be called Hanafi, or Hanbali, in terms of the people who follow certain methods and stuff. And likewise, in matters of belief, he would be called uh, like Shi'i, or Mu'tazili, or Khariji, who found the Shia and the Mu'tazili and the Khawarij. And also, if he adheres to the Salaf of Salaf, their understanding, he's called a Salaf. And just, just to uh, make matters clear, because there are a lot of people who seem to be confused these days, this term was used throughout the centuries. It's not something which a bunch of people made up this century. Okay, uh, recently. Some people imagine that certain scholars, you know, usually they attribute Sheikh al and came up with this term and so forth, and unfortunately this shows poor scholarship. If you look at uh, Imam al-Zahabi, Imam al-Zahabi who died in the year 748, okay, 748, and now in the year 14, 13, 14, 13, 
Imam al Zahabi, in his, um, in a number of his works, he describes certain scholars and calls them that they were Salafi, and I'll give you an example. He describes Ibn Salah, Ibn Salah has scholar hadith in his uh, work, Tafsir al Hasab, calling him Salafi. And also he has a margin, uh, a, um, you might say an index or a concordance of his scholars who taught him, and he describes some of them as being Salafi and Hafida. And in his other work, um, he describes somebody as being Salafi, he's just, he's just, he's just my mind now, who he describes. But the point is that this term was used, as you can see, over 700 years ago, and even before that, was used by Salafi. There's no harm in this term, as long as we're trying to say that it is an adherence to a Salaf of Salaf for these first three generations, right? And obviously it doesn't just mean just trying to stay on your tongue. I mean, you have to adhere to, just like if you call yourself a Sunni, I mean, saying that you're here to the Prophet of Islam Sunni, you should be adhering to Prophet of Islam Sunni truthfully and not just by claiming something. So that's the third term. So, opposing this term, since we did uh, different terms before, we should have a term called al khalaf and something called Khalafi. And this is usually a term, oh, uh, this is a term which is used, oh, excuse me, Khalaf. This is a term which is used not in the linguistical sense over here, meaning that if you're after a Khalaf, okay, therefore we're in Khalaf, but this is a term of, uh, of censure. It's a term, a disparaging term, used to mean people who have, uh, come later on and they have deviated from the belief of the Salaf. Although the Esha'aris, uh, which is a deviated group in belief, they say that the knowledge, they say the people of the Salaf were more knowledgeable and more wise than the people of the Salaf. Although the people of the Salaf were sound better off because they didn't speak about the problems that these Esha'aris have invented or innovated. So the point is Salaf is usually used as a discouraging term. So don't consider yourself saying that I am from the Khalaf and something like that because I'm not from the first three generations, you know. You shouldn't describe yourself that way. You can use the term of censure. Okay. Okay, so now we have, I want to mention two hadiths very quickly. And these two hadiths form a foundation for our understanding of Ahasim al And there are many hadiths on the subject. And I invite you to look at uh, volume one of... Um, Mishkat al and also volume 3 of Kitab al-Sunnah, uh, Kitab al-Sunnah Abu Dawud, Kitab al-Sunnah, you'll find some of these hadiths. But the first hadith, of course, is a hadith which is in Bukhari, where the Prophet said, I'll just mention it in brief, so there always remain a single group upon the truth. Okay? A single group upon the truth. And the second hadith is the hadith which says, the Ummah was right in 73 sects, and they're all going to hell, so many people go to hell, and only one will be saved. And the saved group is, in one narration, he says, those who are upon what he is upon today, and his companions. Okay? So those are two hadith in brief, and I think they're very well known hadith. This is in Abu Dawood and Asra, and this is in Bukhari and Asra. So far, said, there will always remain a single group upon the truth. And then in that, one night he said, they will be manifest, they will be victorious. Upon those who go against them, and upon those who quit or abandon them. And they will remain such until the day of judgment, and one night until the Messiah descends the second time, eighth in Maryam. And another narration says, until Allah decrees his matter, meaning that the course of the age of The second group is that, uh, second hadith, Paul Hassan said that this nation would divide like previous nations divided. And in one narration he says, as the Jews divided into 71 sects, 70 of which went into hell, and only one was saved, and the Christian 72 group, 71 went to hell, and only one was saved, and he said that this Ummah would lie to 73 groups, all of which would, and towards hell, except for one, and the Prophet's companions, 
being very uh, interested in knowing which was the way of salvation, they said his disciples was that which he, they asked, who are they in Messenger 5, number 5, that they are those who are upon what he is upon today and his companions. So the point over here is the Prophet mentioned his companions provide the foundation or the proof that he said earlier that number the Jana'a means that those people who refer back to the understanding of the Salaf al Salah and so forth. The Prophet didn't just say they are just following what he is upon. He said, and my companions were Ashabi. So that the companions are the yardstick to understanding what the Prophet came with. Now let's think about this just from reason. Uh, prior to the truth of the Quran and Sunnah. We know the Prophet came with a message, with a revelation, right? And Allah in the Quran has described, it says, where you عَلْمُنُهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْإِكْمَةِ that he teaches them the book, the scripture, and the wisdom, the wisdom being the Sunnah, as the Quran has mentioned. Who was he teaching this to? Obviously his companions, right? Among his family, like his, the Prophet's wife, and his relatives. And also those people who believed with him in Mecca and Muhajiru and the people in Medina al-Ansar and even those people in Arabia who became Muslims later on and heard some of the Prophet's teachings. These were his companions, all of them. And these are those who he taught to the book and the wisdom. Their understanding is the Arctic. Now that we are so many centuries uh, separated from the Prophet's revelation, there is no way for us to understand how the Prophet what the meaning of that revelation is unless we refer back to their understanding. And that is in itself a, a great lecture. Uh, maybe you can make a whole week of lectures just for fun. Why would you do that? But that's just the foundation. We're just trying to introduce ourselves. Who is this single group that is upon the truth? And who is that in, that says that the Prophet Islam described? So let's see what the scholars of Islam have said. Abdullah Mubarak said that they are in my view, Mubarak he dies in the year one eighty one. 181. So he's part of that earlier generation. Yeah, he's a Tabari. Tabari? I don't know. Tabari? I don't know. Third generation. 81 or 181? 181. He said, It is in my view that they are Ashab al Hadith. The people of Hadith, the adherents of Hadith. Also, we find that Ali ibn Madini, one of the Imam Ahmed's companions, great scholar of uh, Hadith and the Rijal, married with Hadith. Says they are the people of Hadith, they are Ashab al Hadith. Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, if this victorious group is not Ahl al Hadith, then I have no idea who they are. Ahmed ibn Sinan, who is also another scholar, who dies in 259, but after Ahmed, says they are the scholars, they are Ashab al Athar, or Al Athar. Athar and Athar, uh, I read in English, I'm not really sure what he said, he used the plural or part of the, uh, Similar because both are translated really more in the same way. Uh, it means hadith in this sense. It means that which they inherited in the Prophet. And Bukhari said it means Ashab al Hadith. That they are Ashab al Hadith. And you'll find in Sahih al Bukhari he mentions in volume 9 in Kitab al Atifan, uh, the Kitab al Sunnah, he says they are the scholars in the translation. But in his other book, uh, he says that they are Ashab al Hadith or Ahl Hadith. So it's true that they understood, the scholars throughout the centuries, they understood that they themselves, that school, Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, Ahl Hadith, Ahl Salaf al Salaf, they understood that they were the ones who were intended by these narrations of Prophet. And that's why the Salaf used to say, as. Um, Therefore, yeah, so we find that Qatada, who was one of uh, the scholars from Al-Basra, from the Tabi'in, he says, uh, it is from the good fortune, Sa'ada. Now, Sa'ada, good fortune over here, good luck, doesn't mean in the sense of a, a, a worldly sense, but in a religious sense, that Allah Ta'ala has guided this person's death, which is good. That Allah allows for the young man who wants to become religious, or for the person who doesn't speak Arabic, al ajami that he allows him to come across or meet a person, a scholar, from the people of Hadith. And that's because they realized that for those people who wanted to 
whether they were young people and they wanted to become religious, or they were people who didn't speak Arabic, and then therefore they were removed from the source of the Prophet and Sunnah, that the key for their salvation was to meet a man from the people of Hadith. And that is why Qatada said, perhaps it's Qatada or somebody else in Qatada, he said that my maternal uncles, or my paternal uncles, some of his relatives, were Shia, and some of his other uh, relatives were Qadariya, which is another deviant sect. And Allah guided me to a certain person, a certain scholar of hadith in his time, a certain scholar of the Salaf. And Mujahid bin Jabbar, that great scholar of Tafsir, that scholar of Tafsir who Al-Bukhari, uh, who a Thawri, excuse me, a Thawri, who was a scholar from the third generation, said that if Tafsir comes to you by way, explanation of the Quran comes to you by way of Mujahid, pay heed to it, pay attention to it. Because it is known that Mujahid was one of the students of Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas, the Prophet's companion, was that person who the Prophet made dua for him. He said, Oh Allah, فَقَّثُوا فِي الدِّينِ وَعَلِمْهُ التَّأْوِيلِ Give him understanding in the religion and teach him ta'wil. Ta'wil in the sense means explanation of the Quran or the meaning of the Quran. Mujahid was one of Ibn Abbas's students and he said that I presented the Mus'haf, the Quran, the scripture to Ibn Abbas three times. From one cover to another cover, or from its beginning to its end. Stopping him at each verse, saying, asking him, what does this verse mean concerning who was it revealed and when was it revealed? So Mujahid had all this great knowledge of tafsir, and that's why you find that the early scholars of Islam based the tafsir upon the tafsir of Mujahid very often. Imam al Bukhari, for instance, in his Sahih, when he explains the verses in um, chapter titles, it's not usually translated into English, but in the Arabic. Usually when he's explaining different verses, certain words, he's really relying upon the tafsir of Mujahid. And likewise, Imam Shafi also would do likewise, rely upon the tafsir of Mujahid. What did Mujahid say? Mujahid was great off in the second generation. He said, it doesn't matter to me which of these two blessings is greater, the blessing of Islam or the blessing of the Sunnah. And why did he say that? Well, because we know that the only religion which is a man may attain salvation through is what? The religion of Islam. And the only group among the 73 groups within the fold of Islam which a man may attain salvation through is what? The people of the Sunnah. And that's why Mujahid said to me, it makes no difference. Which of these two blessings is greater? That Allah guided me to Islam or that Allah guided me to Sunnah? Because he realized that, what is he trying to say? That, you know, you need both guidances. You need a guidance to Islam if you don't follow one of the six other five false religions. Because as Ibn Abbas said, and with this we'll probably close up the lecture, Ibn Abbas said that the religions are six. Five belong to Satan, and one belongs to Ar-Rahman. And he took this from the verse in Surah Al-Hajj, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that verily those who believe, that's the true religion. And then he said the Christians, the Jews, the Sabians, the Medjus, or the Magians, and those who commit shirk, those are the five religions which belong to Satan. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَفْصِلُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَرِفُونَ That Allah will judge between them on the day of judgment in that which they differ. So the Abbas the religions are six, five belong to Satan and one belongs to Rahman. And Allah, in that one religion which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the original Islam, and concerning the Prophet's Ummah, we know there will be 73 groups and only one will be the saved group. Those who adhere to what the Prophet was upon and his companions. And that is why, uh, Mujahid said, it makes no difference to me which of the two blessings is greater. That Allah guided me to Islam or that Allah guided me to Islam. So, the importance, that was just a brief introduction just to put some terms, you know, uh, down. I didn't mean to take up all the time in trying to explain these terms, but unfortunately that seems to have happened. So, and I'll leave um, some time now to further have some questions concerning what we went over. And I know you might have some questions concerning some other topics, but hopefully, inshallah, they will be expressed uh, uh, throughout the lectures. Well, awful item. It's the kind of answer. Uh, Qaytada, he was a great scholar from the Sada, and he said that it is from the Sa'ada, which means the good fortune, in this sense meaning that Allah has guided that person, has blessed that person, that for the young man, 
when he wants to become religious, usually youth, some, some youth, you know, usually two of them have either they get lost in their passion, and some youth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides that they realize that it's important to become religious. So he wants to become religious now. Which religion shall he follow? And likewise for the non-Arab, because in, especially in the time of the Tabi'in, you might imagine that the non-Arabs were those people who were entering into the fold of Islam. Because early on in this, uh, the history of Islam, I mean, the majority of the Muslims were Arabs, and the people who entered into Islam were usually not Arabs, you know, at that time. That if they wanted to come into Islam, if they were to sit with the Shia, or they were to sit with the Khawarij, or they were to sit with the Qadariya, they would be going astray. What would be the benefit for them to have become Muslims? Obviously, it's better for them to become Muslims than to remain Christians or Jews or fire worshippers or cow worshippers. But the point is, is that there, for them to attain full salvation, we need them to adhere to the Prophet of Sunnah. So, Hasad said it is from the good fortune for the young man who wants to become religion, or for that man, the non-Arab, meaning those who introduce the whole Islam, that Allah guides him that he comes across a man of the Sunnah. And you can see this very clearly here in the United States. Those people who become new Muslims, they come into the Masajid, and their hearts are filled with love of Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu If they bump into good brothers, come to do that. Usually their matters stay straight. If they bump into Sufis or uh, other, you know, Qadianis or Shia or modernists or you name it, usually afterwards you find them not so they necessarily become disbelievers, they revert from their faith, but almost impossible to deal with. They become so entrenched in that bidah, in that heresy. And this is a, and that's what he said about himself, if, if, if my memory is not failing me, if it's my dad, or perhaps it was somebody else's dad, and he said that my paternal uncles or my maternal uncles were Qadariya, and the other set of uncles were Rawaq, which is Shia, and Allah guided me to the Sunnah to a certain individual. So they understood this in their life and they were, you know, they were pleased and they were thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the Sayyidina of the Jihad. And you uh, relating this to relating this to encourage you brothers, really young men to stick to the Sunnah and find those type of people. That's the intent behind it. Uh, to be upfront. Yeah. 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 I just want to um, ask, um, you said the South, um, in the South, like, uh, the South, like, the South, the South, the South, the South, the South, the South, I want to, like, I mean, the South, 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 the Sex are going to hell are number one, number two, number three. However, the scholars later on, throughout the centuries, in books of concerning different sects, you know, they have tried to enumerate them. But basically, it's based upon their ishtihad, upon their reasoning and their deduction. And that's why, if you look at the list, for instance, given by Ibn Jawz in Talbis of Nid, and the list given by Sheikh Afsani in Al Fissal, you know, not Al Fissal, in Al Mil and, uh, a list given by uh, al-Baghdadi in uh, the Sarkh and al-Firaq, usually you find differences in these books. Because it's based upon their ishihad. However, we find the Prophet ﷺ indicating to the major groups of people in Bidah. We find him indicating to the Qadariya, we find him indicating to the Khawarij, we find him indicating to the Shia in a narration which is related upon Ali, and it's authentic on his part, so it's understood that he must have understood this from the Prophet ﷺ. We find him indicating to different groups you know, in general. So, we find that. But in terms of the Christians, the Jews, the Prophet did not say which would be said. But we do know, though, that obviously the safe group would be that group which adhered to what their Prophet came with. So, with the Jews, would be those people who adhered to the teachings of the Prophet Musa, alayhi salam. And with the Christians, would be those who adhered to the teachings of Isa and Maryam and Messiah, the Messiah, alayhi salam unadulterated by their own understanding. So obviously this, this group of Trinitarians that we see populating one-fourth of the world are not the same group of Christians. Yes, that's the because yeah. They the because they don't follow the teachings of Isa and Maryam. That's obvious. But, so, but who exactly were they? Did they have a certain name? Did they live in a certain time? And so forth. We cannot specifically identify in the historical sense. Like, however, we do know from other hadiths that there were some of them around in the time of Prophet Muhammad, like the hadith concerning the Salman and Sadducees becoming a Muslim. 
and the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the hadith uh, which is uh, related to Sahih Muslim by um, somebody black and Mujahiri uh, I forgot what the first name is but uh, when his companions he said that surely Allah looks upon the people of the earth and he hated them Arabs and non-Arabs except for a few remnants of the people of the scripture meaning that at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there were some few people in the scripture who uh, still um, adhered to the teachings of the Prophet Musa and the Prophet Isa Warakad bin Nawfal might be an example uh, the Prophet's uh, wife Khadija uh, uncle also uh, Najashi and Habasha you know seems to be an example so there seems to be some sort of example but as in terms of groups and so forth and so forth I don't think we can identify Allah okay then Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what, what is the, uh, uh, instead of the Sunni game, you, you use the word of Hadith, and then the word of the Sunni game. Yeah. There's a difference, not historically, historically, Ahl Sunnah, this is something in my lecture, I forgot to mention this. Uh, Ahl Sunnah and Ashab al Hadith and Ahl al Hadith and Ahl al Asr are all synonymous terms. However, though, that's in the, in the earliest sense of the word. However, though, afterwards, you know, we find that Ahl Sunnah seems to be identified in a sense which is more general than Ahl Hadith. And there are two uh, understandings for this, one correct and one incorrect. The first sense, when you say somebody from Ahl Sunnah, means he's not a Shia. Not in the Shia. And there are various sects. This is the most general sect. And this is what people understand today, even the Christians. When you find the Christians writing in their newspapers or in their books, they do the same Sunday, he said he's not a Shia. Irrespective of what his creed is. If his creed is that of Ahl Hadith or Ahl al Hizal, if he's a Marquesari or he's a Khaji, he's a Sunni in the sense that he's not a Shia. A second sense means Ahl Sunnah. In the sense that it's equal to Ahlul Hadith. That they have certain specific beliefs. And this is what the scholars meant by Ahlul Sunnah. However, though, um, due to the ascendancy or the appearance of the Ash'ari, who labeled themselves as Ahlul Sunnah, it then became in the Middle Ages, okay, when you say Ahl Sunnah, you mean that you are an Ash'ari or you're a Mahfudi. Mahfudi means just Hanafi Ash'ari. It's all me, okay? That's basically what it is. There are a few different things in Al-Qaeda, but that's basically the, the difference. You know so when you say Ahl Sunnah means you are Ash'ari or Mahfudi, in Al-Qaeda and in Fiqh, you follow one of the four Imams, blindly, and in your Ibadah, you took one of the major Qariqahs, you know. So this is what it meant to be Ahl Sunnah. So much so that we find a person, a great scholar of Hadith, not scholar of Hadith, a scholar of Aqidah, who, like, who had correct Aqidah, and he was a Safarini, you know, he has a book called Lawamu and Anwar al Tahiyya, a uh, nice book of uh, Aqidah, which uh, the people of uh, correct belief often use as a major reference. When he says in the beginning of the book, who are Ahl Sunnah, he says they are the Ash'aris, the Masudis, and Ahl Hadith. Ahl al-Asad, he says. This is a completely false, wrong belief, you see. Because he probably had correct belief, he decided to stick himself, you know, amongst them. But there is no way that the Ash'aris and the Masudis are from Ahl sunnah Unless you mean in this general sense, they're not Shia. In the sense they do not revile the Prophet's companions. They do not curse the Prophet's companions. But if you mean in Ahl sunnah as in the book, like as sunnah by Imam Ahmed, a sunnah which is in Sunan Abu Abu Dawood from volume 3 in English. If you mean Ahl Sunnah in the sense that they believe what Imam al Bukhari penned in Kitab al Tawheed, or what Ibn Khazirah penned in his work at Tawheed, if you, or what Ibn Bakr wrote in, uh, in Ibana, they're not from Ahl Sunnah's matter. On all these matters they disagree concerning Allah's names and attributes, concerning um, revelation, concerning the position of reasoning in religion, concerning the position of Qadr and so forth, and lots of many matters. And that's, that's the topic in itself also. But the point is, is that, so Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, you know, you have to be very careful now, because you have to understand that when you use these terms, you have to use it according to the, the, the time, the, with the, uh, the term in its, um, 
in its uh, historical context, right? When you say Ahl Sunnah now, the majority of the Islamic world understands that you're Ash'ari or Masudi. In many senses, the terms Ahl Sunnah, except for amongst the people of, of Ahl Hadith, you know, when this term is used, what comes first and foremost to mind are these two groups. And there's reasons why, because uh, historically, there were certain uh, nations which had ascendancy in the Islamic world and took over large areas of the Islamic world. And they, they had certain, usually countries usually have certain beliefs with them. You know? And they, they, they propagated the Ash'ari belief in Africa, West Africa, the Muahideen state uh, of West Africa, and also the uh, Ayyubid state of the Muahideen Ayyubi nation and so forth, uh, and the East, the Islamic East. And those countries which derived afterwards, back and they basically replaced the beliefs of the Hadith with the Ash'ari belief. And that's a subject again. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, the next, actually, the next session is on the same topic. So. So, um, did Abu Hanifa revolt against the Imam, or did he permit? I tried to uh, permit. What do you know, I don't know. This is something which needs to be, I mean, um, authenticated. It is true that you will find in books of stuff that they attribute to Abu Hanifa the statement saying that he permitted revolting against the unjust ruler, or the unjust ruler, uh, provided the people feel that they would be able, they would have the ability to overcome that unjust ruler and place a ruler who was more just and pious in his uh, stead. You know, they feel they have the ability for a successful revolt. Uh, the first question is, is that did Abu Hanif actually say it? That's one thing. And if he did say it, therefore, is, is his statement in itself a proof? No, I and mean, we'll see in the, the principles that obviously that we say that no single person from the principles of our beliefs, that we, the foundation of our beliefs, is that there is no single person who is in this ummah infallible from error and sin except for the Prophet Muhammad That everybody else, you know, their statements are all underneath the, or are to be weighed in the balance of the Quran and Sunnah. And therefore, we find a very clear hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is found in the Bukhari, you know, and elsewhere, that the Prophet ﷺ said that prohibiting his companions to revolt against the rulers, the unjust rulers, unless there was a clear um, disbelief, you know, a sign of disbelief, in which they had evidence, you know, from Allah's hand. I mean, that this is something which is established in the Quran, and this is disbelief, and not something which they imagine to, to be disbelief. Then, that only that time, they would be allowed to revolt. Now, uh, indeed, that time becomes required to revolt. You know, unless the people feel that they cannot, they don't have the power to overcome him and set it not to revolt. That's different. But general rule is required to revolt in that case. How about Abdullah Zubair? Right. Now, as far as Abdullah Zubair and the Hussein and these others who have been, and others historically who have been attributed in the Salaf who have revolted against the ruler, scholars have said that basically these uh, Sahaba or these Tabi'een or these early generations of Muslims, uh, made ishtihad and they felt they were, you know, able. And then afterwards, as Ibn Hajar mentions in Qasr al the this door has been closed by the ulama. So they found that this is an unsuccessful need of change. That no matter how much their number, or how many their number, they will be able to do it. Plus, the presence of the, towards the Prophet Sallallahu you know, that even if there was, a, if it was imagined that it would be possible to revolt against the ruler, the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi shut this possibility the door for this possibility closed once and for all. So how do we explain their position? It's obviously they didn't receive them the Sunnah because we feel that these are men of, of strong adherence to the Prophet so they wouldn't openly you know, go against his words unless they felt that they were doing something which was sanctioned by the religion. So either they were unaware of these petty, you know what I'm saying, or they had a special understanding concerning these petty, you know what I'm saying? But either the case, whether they were unaware of the hadith or they had a specific understanding to these hadith, which is false understanding, we might say, that as Ibn Hajar mentions in Texas values, the Ulama have realized when the earliest generations tried to do this, you know, that it only leads to more problems. 
And as in the same way he writes in this book, which is translated into the English language, public duties in Islam, public history in Arabic. Yeah, so they translate public duties in Islam. And he says that when people try to check an injustice, it usually leads to another injustice. Greater than the initial injustice. This is one of the, the symbols of people who turn out that they do not revolt against their unjust rules. Well, I think Alright. Oh, I think we will find that. Yeah, that would be right. But it wasn't the overwhelming thing used, maybe some, someone used it, like in the river, uh, the river people, someone. Right. But it wasn't the overwhelming thing used, used by 30 Yeah, right. When did it prevalence of this term set up here? Right. I mean, obviously, it just needs a, a historical, you know. Sure. Is there still an equal around? Maybe you can just say a Muslim or sure. isn't it enough? Obviously, I mean, just need the historical research, right? Which is beyond, I mean, you know, my knowledge to survive, you know, when was this term, when did we gain this currency that it now has? But we do find, though, that the scholars of Islam use certain terms during certain periods of time. For instance, the term Ashab al Hadith, right? Who uses this term Ashab al Hadith today? Who uses the term Ahl al Hadith outside of maybe the Indian subcontinent, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? It's not known in the Arab world, you know, like it's, it's basically not used, you know what I'm saying? However, can we say that the, the, the meaning that this term has is now a defunct meaning? That the, that group of Ahl al-Hadith no longer exists? That their time has come and passed and it's just a historical occurrence and a historical group that have, no, obviously not, because the Prophet said always remain one group of his ummah. And the scholars have identified, and this is since the day of judgment, this is the Ahl al-Hadith. Now they might, they might call themselves in one time, this, or they might call themselves at another time that, this all is going to be reflected by the, the terms and the, the circumstances they are. And give you an example of the term Tawheed. Okay? If you look in Sahih al-Bukhari, when Imam uh, al-Bukhari uses the word Kitab al-Tawheed, also Ibn Khuzayma, who comes in the century after Imam al-Bukhari, and has a book called Kitab al-Tawheed, where it's fast, it's fast, it's fast, it's the affirmation of the attributes or the qualities of the Lord of the world, you don't discuss in it the worship of Allah alone. You see, the, the issue of Tawheed, right, in that time, was basically affirming Allah's attributes and not negating those attributes. And as one of uh, the grandsons of Ibn Abdul Wahab said, that's because this, the appearance of grave worship, right, came long after Imam Ahmed and so forth. Now, if you look at Sheikh Ibn Abdul Wahab and his Kitab of Tawheed, right, all it discusses about what? Singling out Allah in worship, you see. And so much so that he only really puts one chapter, the last chapter, to talk about a well laws above the twelve. And most of it just deals about singling out a law of worship and, you know, protecting the worship of a law alone. So, here's the term Tawheed, right? In the earliest scholars, in the writings of the earliest scholars, right, it had a certain currency to it, certain understanding. It meant to affirm a lot of attributes. Okay, nowadays when you talk about Tawheed, right, you basically mean not just affirming Allah's attributes, but you also mean singling out Allah's worship. This issue of singling out Allah's worship was not an issue in the earliest generation. Even the people of Bidah, the Khawad and the Shia, the earliest Shia did not use to worship grace. Long after the, the, the passing of the age of Imam Ahmed and Imam Bukhari, this grave worship and the cult of saints and so forth appeared in the Islamic world. So here what I'm trying to say is that the term Tawheed has to be understood in its, in its significance at that time. Can we say that those people who use the term Tawheed to mean one aspect of belief in Allah in that time were incorrect or somewhat negligent or that those who used it in a different sense in later days were incorrect? No. Not whatsoever because it's, it's trying to all describe a certain reality that is worshiping Allah Allah. And likewise with this term, you see what I'm saying? Whether they call themselves, uh, you know, Salafi, meaning they follow a Salaf al or whether they call themselves Ahl al-Hadith or Ashab al-Hadith or Ahl al-Athar or Ahl al-Sunnah al jamaah these were all terms which were used during a certain historical period and had a certain historical significance to it, right? And that is why, uh, you know, I mean, the term Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah today, you know, I mean, is in my opinion, right? Even though people like to use it, uh, it has gained some currency maybe in the last five or six years, you know, as an alternative to using the word Salafi, you know. In, in many circles, when you say Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah, it means Isha. It 
means the Ashram is the mass movie. So when we say Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah now, who do we refer to? I mean, who are we? We have to further define it. And just like saying it's Muslim. I mean, our name is Muslim. You know, there's no other name for us, right? When you say a Muslim, who are, which Islam are you describing? Obviously, you mean Islam is Prophet Islam. But which of these groups is going to ha- hold the correct true claim? You know, deed to the, the, the Islam of Prophet Islam. So sometimes you are required, you know, okay, to further describe the term, you know. And Allah Alam, there might appear uh, a group of people, you know what I'm saying, who have completely incorrect beliefs and call themselves Salafis. I'll give you an example, like the followers of Abdul Qadir Sufi. You know, saying Abdul Qadir Murabat, you know, he writes these works in English. He calls himself Salafis. These are a bunch of Sufis, you know, and they have, you know, one of their books, they insult Imam al-Shafi and so forth. They attack him. How can somebody be uh, Salafi and, and attack Imam al-Shafi? Is that I mean, reasonable to imagine? So, you know, it might become that there might become a certain area of time where when this term is used, people will think of the father of Sufi and his adherence and his teachings, right? But then, therefore, it might not be permissible to use this term in that specific area. And some other term might be used. You see what I'm trying to get at? Well, I don't know.